Good evening. A little hot. We've been uh, going through the book of Jonah, and uh, we're now on chapter 3. We're in week 3 and now in chapter 3. And if so if you would turn this evening to uh, Jonah chapter 3. We're going to begin tonight by reading all of Jonah chapter 3, which is not much. It's about 10 verses. So you could say later that you read a whole chapter of a book of the Bible, if you like. I'll give you a minute to get there. I'll be reading out of the NIV, which is the Pew Bible in front of you. Uh, so it's on page 917 if you want to cheat and go there with that Bible. Jonah chapter 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to that great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very important city. A visit required three days. On the first day, Jonah started into the city, and he proclaimed, Forty more days, and Nineveh will be overturned. The Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. Then he issued a proclamation in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. Jonah chapter 3. There's a few things we want to look at in this passage tonight, but over all of it we want to look at the miracle of Nineveh's conversion. The miracle of Nineveh's conversion. Uh, Jonah chapter 3 begins in the first four verses with, uh, Jonah's reluctant obedience. Jonah's reluctant obedience. That's your first fill in the blank. Remember, Jonah in chapter 2, we saw last week, was not exactly repentant. Uh, yes, he was let go of by the fish, but he never repented of his sin of leaving, fleeing from Tarshish, fleeing from the presence of the Lord, fleeing from obedience to God. He never in his prayer committed to then go and be obedient. He just wanted deliverance. And God, because of his mercy, let him continue. Let him be vomited out of this fish on land. And so now here we have Jonah, and God has to tell him again to go to Nineveh. Now perhaps God didn't give him a chance. Perhaps he just right away started speaking to Jonah again and commanded him a second time. But Perhaps Jonah was thinking, well, great, God delivered me from the fish, and now I can go back to Jerusalem. I can go and see the temple of, the God, of God again. And God says again, go to Nineveh and proclaim to them what I tell you to. And so Jonah goes, perhaps fearing that the fish is close by and will gobble him up once again. And he does go. He is obedient, at least maybe half-heartedly. So he goes and he proclaims God's message of judgment. And this again, I don't think he was probably saying this with much sympathy for the Ninevites, with great compassion in his heart that they would turn and repent. Jonah was more likely preaching fire and brimstone, 40 days and Nineveh will repent, with maybe a little grin on his face, hoping that in 40 days or maybe 39, that judgment would come on them. Forty days in Nineveh will be overthrown. So this is Jonah and Jonah's reluctant obedience. But we don't want to talk a whole lot about Jonah. We dogged him last week and we're going to dog him some more next week. 
Today, we want to focus on what really happens in Nineveh. We want to see the miracle of Nineveh's conversion. So what we're going to see in verses 5 through 9 are Nineveh's immediate repentance. Nineveh's immediate repentance. And we're going to look at first the response of the people, and then we're going to look at the response of the king. The response of the people and the response of the king. First, the response of the people. We'll look again. I'll read again from verses 4 and 5. It says this. On the first day Jonah started into the city, he proclaimed, Forty more days and Nineveh shall be overturned. The Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. After one day's journey, is what this text means. Remember, Nineveh was a three-day journey from end to end, is basically what it was saying earlier. That to stay in Nineveh required three days. It means more literally, that to walk through Nineveh would take three days from the outer city, the outer city limits, to the other side. This is not the walled city itself. This is more likely the city proper. And so just in one day, in one day of preaching a message of judgment, the message that all it was was in 40 days, Nineveh is going to be overthrown. In one day, the message gets beyond Jonah, and it goes to all of the city. And everyone, from the greatest to the least, repent. The poorest and the richest. The outcasts and the prominent. They all strip their clothes and put on sackcloth. They all sit in mourning and repentance. This is a miracle. This is a miracle. The message went beyond Nineveh, or beyond Jonah, sorry. And this was an immediate repentance. Nineveh was most likely, we're not exactly sure, but Nineveh was probably somewhere around 100,000 people plus. This is a pretty large city. And yes, perhaps some people were just peer pressured into this repentance, and maybe some really didn't repent, but... Even if it was most, thousands and thousands and thousands of people, many of which, most of which, had not even seen Jonah, just heard this message from God's prophet Jonah through the grapevine and immediately repented. It's a miracle. Let's also look at the response of the king in verses 6 to 9. The response, is the response of the king. I'll read it again. It says this, when the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. We'll start there with verse 6. This king, he steps off of his throne, and he sits down in dirt, in dust. In essence, saying that my rule and my king, my kingship has been for not. I've led these people in this horrible sin and evil, and I'm not worthy to sit on my throne. I, I must sit in ashes before God. He also took off his royal robe and put on sackcloth, sig signifying the same thing, that he doesn't deserve this robe. He doesn't deserve his position and status. Instead, he deserves sackcloth. He joins down in the dirt with his own people, repenting of his own sin and of the sin that he's allowed his people to stay in. Verse 7 says this, <clears throat> Then he issued a proclamation in Nineveh, By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. This king and his nobles, all of his, his higher-ups, basically, uh, his staff, issue this decree throughout all of Nineveh that no one will eat, no one will drink. And this is probably not just for a day. This is probably for the length of the 40 days that they had to wait for this judgment to come. This is a miracle. But it goes on, verse 8. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. See, everyone, even animals, 
had to put on sackcloth. So it'd be like putting our dogs in a sack of potatoes. And we might think that's really cute, you know, but this is signifying that no work is going to be done. Everyone is covered in sackcloth. Everyone is dedicated to this repentance. Even the animals that don't know better. We're dedicating them. No work is going to be done. No eating is going to be done. No drinking is going to be done. Complete and utter repentance. And then in verse 9, the king says, Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. See, these people weren't certain. They didn't know for sure that if they did these things, God would stop his judgment. They just held out hope that maybe he would. Maybe, just maybe, he would. And all the city repents. This is very different from the attitude we see in Jonah, isn't it? All that we've heard from Jonah so far is, God, save me from this fish. God, bring me back to Jerusalem. God, come on, save me. But first with the sailors and now with this entire city, we see a complete contrast between these pagans and this prophet of God, this man of God. They have repentance. Jonah seemingly has none. So what we see in this passage is the miracle of conversion. The miracle of conversion. See, Nineveh and its evil is greater than we may see in our lifetime, or at least as bad as we may see in our lifetime. Remember, these are the people famous for impaling their victims after war. And Jonah was a man who hated Ninevites, hated them, was prejudiced against them, and he hated their sin. They were the lowest on the totem pole as far as who Jonah would like to minister to. Jonah was a man who had to be dragged literally inside of a fish to get to Nineveh. He was there three days and three nights. Does this sound like a great evangelism strategy to you? Let's go to that place that is most resistant and most evil in our society and let's send to them someone who hates them, someone who we're going to have to drag there and leave. We're going to have to threaten by throwing him in the sea in a fish. Does that sound like a great idea to you? How did this happen? How did this conversion happen? Why did they have such an amazing response? Well, it wasn't because of the method. It wasn't because of the strategy wasn't necessarily because of the message. All it was was one phrase, message of judgment. The reason they repented is because all conversion is a miracle. All conversion is a miracle. It's a supernatural work of God. It wasn't because of Jonah. It wasn't because of the Ninevites. And it wasn't because of the message either. All conversion is a miracle. Turn with me to two different passages. We're going to go to Ephesians chapter 2 and Titus chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 2 and Titus chapter 3. We will come back to Jonah, so keep your finger there. But we'll start with Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. It says this. We'll read from... Verse 4 to verse 9. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us. In Christ Jesus. <clears throat> Excuse me. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. 
You see, we need God's life in us. We need God, by His Spirit, to work in our hearts so that we can call out in faith and we can be saved by His grace. God saves us to show His kindness and His grace and His mercy. Not just to Ninevites, but also to people like us. Titus chapter 3 says it like this as well. Titus chapter 3, starting in verse 4, says this. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. We should not be a people who trust in our own methods and clever presentations or arguments. We should not trust that certain people will, will repent and believe because they've been raised right, because they've been taught correctly. We need to be a people who ask God to send His Spirit into our hearts and into this world, into our country, into our city, into our church, into our families. Because all conversion is a miracle. And we need that miracle of God's Spirit. That's what we need. What are you trusting will bring people to Christ? What am I trusting? What sermon? What church service? Or what pastor? What parenting guidelines and principles? Am I trusting in all the things that I can put together and I can creatively do, or am I trusting in the work of God's miracle of conversion? And am I calling out and crying to God for that? Now, it is true God did use Jonah. He graciously and mercifully chose to use a servant that was even unwilling to be used through a message of judgment and fire and brimstone, but it wasn't because of Jonah. It's because God mercifully allowed Jonah to be part of his miracle of conversion, and he allows all of us to be part of that as well. But do we trust in the part that we have to take care of? in how good we are at it? Or do we beg and call out and cry for God to graciously use me? This is all I have. Use me. We also need to see that no one is beyond conversion. No one is beyond conversion. That's your second fill in the blank there. If you go back to Ephesians chapter 2 with me, we'll read the first three verses, verses 1 through 3. It says this, As for you, Christians, First Baptist Church, as for you, you were dead. You were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient, all of us, Pastor Tom and me included, even Laura, all of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. It's easy for us to look at Nineveh and say, well, like Jonah, not them. They are horrible people. Surely they will be resistant to the gospel. Surely they will never accept Christ. They're too far gone. They're out of the reach of the gospel. The truth of the matter is Jonah and us could be just as bad as Nineveh. What's different about us? Well, that comes in verse 4. But, 
because of his great love for us, God, being rich in mercy, made us alive. Some of your Bibles translate that as, but God. And in seminary or in Bible school, I put up on my, I had a quote wall, and I put all these quotes up outside in my hallway, and one of them was just uh, a dot, 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 but God from Ephesians 2. And you may have heard a message with that kind of illustration before, but that is our life. That is everything about who I am and about where I can be or who I can be or how I can be saved. It's that dot, dot, dot is all I do. And then God steps in, but God. It's the same in Titus chapter 3. We look at Titus chapter 3, verse 4 as well. It says this, But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously. But God. Everyone, all of us are in equal need of God's grace, working through the Holy Spirit to give us life. We are all alike dead in sin. Grace to all of us is equal to grace to the rest of us. We all need the same amount. And conversion is and will always be just as much a miracle for you and I as it is for people like the Ninevites. And no one, no one is beyond the reach of God. It may become very easy for all of us to question whether or not that family member, to question whether or not that, that person who is so steeped in sin could ever accept the gospel. It can be very discouraging and depressing for us. I have a father who is very resistant to the gospel. I have a cousin who is an atheist now and is very hostile to the gospel. And it could be easy for me to say, I just don't see how it can happen. Arguments that go nowhere. Conversations that fall on deaf ears. But I look at Jonah and I see the city of Nineveh with immediate repentance. I see a God who saved me when I didn't really care much for him. And I realize that I need a miracle. I need God's Spirit. No one is beyond conversion. No one is out of God's reach. Don't ever lose hope. Finally, in verse 10, we see that God relents from destroying the city. God relents from destroying the city. Verse 10 says, when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. What we see here is that God is mercifully patient. God is mercifully patient. We don't have time to go to 2 Peter 3 right now, but you remember before that it, there's questions about where is God? Why is he taking so long? And Peter tells us, God tells us through Peter that God is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to reach repentance. God has been patient for a very long time, much longer than I can be, and much longer than I have been. But God is so mercifully patient. His declaration of judgment that he used through Jonah was not 
to make them afraid and not to play and toy with them. It was so that they might repent. And they did. And he is happy to hold back his judgment. That he gives them 40 days in the first place should tell us that God had always been about Nineveh's repentance. And God desires the same from us. God desires the same from us. I want to end tonight by playing a video for you. Some of you may have seen it before. It was made in 1989, and you could tell, but it is an excellent, excellent video. It's called e Town. It was done by New Tribes Missions, and it tells the story, it reenacts the story of Mark and Gloria Zook. They are missionaries to a tribe, a, the Mok tribe in Papua New Guinea, a tribe of about 300 people who had never heard the gospel before, uh, were spirit worshipers. They would uh, kill tribesmen because the spirits told them to. And Mark and Gloria were middle-aged missionaries. Middle-aged missionaries who were told when they felt called to go to this place that you're too old. You're too old to begin as a missionary. You're too old to learn a language. You're going to be too old and you're going to be too susceptible to the diseases and sicknesses that are there. And they went from church to church until finally a church told them, we see that calling of God in your life and we will send you out into ministry. And what followed is a miraculous and dramatic conversion that reminds me a lot of the conversion we see in Nineveh. And that's what I want to play for you right now. For two months, we taught key Old Testament stories chronologically before we finally introduced Jesus Christ as the Savior, born as a babe in this world. As we studied the life of Christ, they fell in love with Him and Jesus became the Mok hero. They loved Him and they idolized Him. Never during the weeks Mark taught did a villager miss a lesson, though he taught for three months, Monday through Friday, two times a day. Villagers that were sick were brought on makeshift stretchers. And when an expectant mother was near delivery, they arranged for her to be close enough to the meeting to hear the story. The baby arrived in the middle of one of the sessions, but the teaching still went on. At times the moke were so intense they stopped eating and would not even sleep. They spent every waking moment discussing the message and re-listening over and over again to the lessons recorded on cassette tapes. This wonderful Jesus was perfect and he could do anything. He was God. They finally came to explain the betrayal by Judas and the trial of Jesus before Pontius Pilate. Judas' betrayal was upsetting to the moat, but they still had faith that somehow Jesus would escape. That was the last story we told them before the gospel presentation. At the end of it, we said, Tomorrow we will finish our talk. The next morning, the people were all gathered before sunrise. I told the story of Jesus appearing before Pilate. The people were very sober. When during our skit they saw Jesus being spit upon, beaten, and finally put to death, they were simply appalled. They were distraught. They couldn't believe what they were seeing. Because the death and shedding of blood is so significant to the gospel story, we had rigged a balloon filled with colored water to be pierced by our designated Roman soldier. It was when they saw the blood that the story began to take on significance. Our explanation and portrayal of Jesus Christ's resurrection was simple, but to them, very powerful. The Savior was alive. Then I went back into the Old Testament stories and beginning with Abel explained how Jesus was our acceptable sacrifice just like Abel's sacrifice was accepted by God. When I finally reached the story of Abraham and Isaac, I said to them, 
Listen, just as a real lamb was substituted for Isaac, so Christ's death and blood has been shed as a substitution for you. At that point, the lights really went on. I could see and hear them responding all over the crowd. I believe, I believe, I believe. I stood in their midst and asked them what they thought. From all over, responses came like this. I know I was born in sin. I believe Jesus paid for my sin, that he died in my place. He is my sin bearer. I lived in fear trying to please the spirits, for I knew no other way to be free from sin. But God in his grace has sent you to us. I've heard it and believe the death and blood of Christ is payment for my sin. I believe it and God has forgiven me. On that day, almost all the village expressed belief in our Lord Jesus Christ. There was a sense of tremendous relief. The Mok are generally a restrained people, but as the gospel sunk in and new believers sensed the liberation from sin, spontaneous rejoicing broke out. Watch what happened. <laughs> Village believers stating that he too believes that Christ has paid for his sins. Itao, which means it's true or it's good, it's very true. Village grandma rejoicing that he believes, so does she. Different ones giving testimony as to their belief in Christ as their sin bearer. Mark saying that if they really are believing, then God's word says that their sin is forgiven. Itao, it's good, it's true. Spontaneous rejoicing breaks out. This went on for two and a half hours. We have considered your interest in our mission board, and I'm sorry we do not believe you are missionary material. You'll just be too old and possible. Gloria, don't fret yourself so over those people. Consider your health. You have children. Mark and Gloria, as a church, we are standing behind you. We'll pray for you. We'll support you. Go in the Lord's name. Powerful. Anybody do that when they were converted? Thought maybe, you know, if we all got in the center aisle here, you know. <laughs> Conversion is a miracle. It's a miracle that was done to the Mook tribe. It's a miracle that was done in every one of our hearts. And it's a miracle that we desperately need to call out for for all those that we want to be saved. Even those sometimes we don't want to be saved. Would you pray with me? 
Father, thank you that you worked a miracle in my heart. Lord, that even though I was dead in sin, that I could have been just as bad as anyone else that I could point my finger at and say, they are beyond the gospel. But you saved me. You gave me new life by the Spirit. And you've given me a mission to be used by you to give life to others, to bring your message of eternal life and salvation to the world. And whatever small part I feel like I might be in it, you have chosen me to use it, to bring your gospel. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Thank you for giving this wondrous message, not just to me, but to people like the Mok tribe, to people like the Ninevites, to people that are just as desperate for your gospel as I am. Would you make my heart a mercifully patient and compassionate heart like yours is? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.